Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Hello and welcome to this edition of Access to Democracy. I'm your host today, Steve Francisco. It's my pleasure to invite our, or to welcome our special guest today, Dr. Merlin Brown, who practices internal medicine at Southdale Internal Medicine, and he's also the author of a book here entitled, Where Doesn't It Hurt? And uh, Dr. Brown, welcome to Access to Democracy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Many people think that we may have dealt with health care reform in the 2010 Affordable Care Act that was passed, but actually maybe uh, in our discussion today we're going to find that some problems were addressed, but a lot of other problems were not addressed by the health care reform law. And as a way of uh, uh, advancing this discussion today, uh, a couple of interesting statistics about how big uh, health care is in the United States. It's estimated that this year in 2013 that the U.S. will spend 2.8 trillion dollars on health care costs. That's 750 billion dollars more every year for health care is spent in the U.S. than in other developed countries. Um, over eight thousand dollars, that is the average annual health care spending per person in U.S. dollars in 2010 but yet our life expectancy in the U.S. is lower than it is in the United Kingdom, Australia, Japan, and some other countries. Um, number 50, that's where the U.S. ranks in infant mortality, uh, nine spots below Cuba. So what has happened to our American health care system? It's a good question. Um, I would say greed, insurance companies, insurance companies managing what we do and controlling the costs. Um, it's kind of embarrassing to be in such a great country and to have those statistics. Um, I think there's a lot of factors that go into that and so I don't know if we want to mm -hmm. uh, talk about some of them uh, mm -hmm. separately. Um, but certainly there are a lot of uninsured who don't get medical care at all. So that lowers the statistics for life expectancy. And before the passage of the Affordable Care Act, I think the statistic I had seen was about 47 million Americans with no health insurance. But after passage of the law, they're going to extend coverage to about 32 million of the 47 million that don't have it. Right. So health care obviously should improve their health. You know, good access, good preventive care. Um, you know, blood pressure control, cholesterol, diabetes control, you know, all of that should improve patients' health mm -hmm. and actually decrease costs down the road because they would need less hospitalizations and less costly surgeries potentially. And mm -hmm. yeah. So you were prompted a couple of years ago and, and, oh, in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell our viewers too, I'm one of your patients. Uh, you and I, you've been my personal physician for about the past 10 years or so since I moved back to Minnesota after living out east. And um, a few years ago, you became really very alarmed about what was happening with the American health care system. And so you and a patient of yours, uh, Carla Sheffield, Charla? Charla. Charla yes. Sheffield, mm -hmm. have written this book, Where Doesn't It Hurt? So. What is it about our health care system that is so alarming that prompted you to write this book? There are so many 
uh, so many problems that I saw early on in this uh, in this process that I wanted the public to know about because a lot of it is hidden. We kind of cover for the insurance companies with the way we process claims and the way they control what we do. So Charlotte suggested that we write a book to expose all this, mm -hmm. and and in the process of writing the book to expose the problems, uh, we also had a solution, and we wanted it to be written in a short, simple format so an average person could read it. And actually your book is only, it's 100 pages, and yes. I've read it a couple of times now, and you and I have talked about some of the ideas in the book, but it's kind of interesting to me to note that we had a health care reform law that was about 2,400 pages or so in length, and you seem to have crystallized uh, really what I read to be in many ways an indictment of our current health insurance system condensed it into 100 pages. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the things that um, insurance companies are doing right now that are affecting the way that you practice medicine and are affecting the outcomes that patients can expect. Yeah, there, there's kind of three parts to that. You know, initially insurance companies just bothered us by requiring a lot of paperwork. And then as the requirements that they put on us increase, mm -hmm. the administrator burden goes up, which means the cost goes up. So we hire more and more staff. As costs go up, your premiums go up. And now we're, um, now with accountable care organizations, uh, the new direction we're going with pay performance quality measures, which all sound great on paper. The way they affect us is they don't allow us to individualize care. And so it's much more than just a paperwork problem, a administrative cost problem. Now it actually is affecting the way we practice medicine because everything I do all day long, I have to get permission from them to do it. So did I write it in the right format? Am I, do I have the right code? I have, do I have the right staff to get in the computer to submit it to get, to get uh, reimbursement? Mm -hmm. So everything I do is based on permission from them. So a lot of people, it may come as news to folks that you don't actually set your own fees even for the doctor office visit, that this is something that's really established by the insurance companies, health insurance companies that you deal with. Yes. Uh, the fees that you see listed on your EOB or explanation of benefits, mm -hmm. um, those are just insurance game numbers. We just set an artificially high fee so we can capture whatever the insurances decide to pay us. We take 30 different insurance companies right now in our clinic and so we have 30 different reimbursement amounts for the same service. And since we're a small clinic, we have very little negotiating power and we just take whatever they give us. Mm -hmm. And right now that's about 30% less than a lot of the big clinics because mm -hmm. of their negotiating power. And you're constantly, it sounds like from what you're saying too, Dr. Brown, you're constantly engaged in this game of trying to outguess what the insurance company is willing to pay you. And, and another thing that struck me in reading your book was just really how totally arbitrary some of these fees are that are set by insurance companies for what they'll reimburse on and what they won't. Right, they're, they're not based on real market prices. Uh, the insurance just sets the fee. So many of the services we provide, we don't get reimbursed at all. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the services were overpaid. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a physical on a young college student that takes 15 minutes because they just went in because you know mom made them and the school made them you know we get paid a lot for that hmm. because we get paid according to codes mm -hmm. and then other services you know the congestive heart failure patient in the nursing home that requires 30 phone calls in 15 days we don't get paid anything for that mm -hmm. and when you talk about the difference in price between what a hospital or healthcare provider actually, the cost that they incur providing a service versus what the insurance companies charge for it. You mentioned in your book the example that at the time you wrote the book, the average cost for an MRI in the Twin Cities market was, I think you said, about $520. And yet insurance companies were charging one, two, and sometimes even three times that much for an MRI. Right, and the, the amount depends on what the insurance negotiated with that particular provider or that particular imaging center. But most of my patients who pay out of their deductibles mm -hmm. or health savings accounts, their MRIs run 1000 to $2,000. Mm -hmm. And I know that they cost around 500 mm -hmm. 
it's something so, that when people are talking about where the waste is in health care and why we have some of the most expensive, the most expensive health care in the industrialized world, there probably some of the reasons for that are right there. Oh, yes. That's one example. Absolutely. The focus right now on saving money is to limit care or not do the MRI. And I think one of the things that was missed was that we need to focus on why the MRI costs so much in the first place. So we need to decrease cost of the services as well to mm -hmm. save money, not just limit the services we're providing. Mm -hmm. So an insurance company's goal, what they'll tell you is that, is that we watch what you do so you don't order unnecessary tests and cost the system more money. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing in there to actually lower the cost of the test. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where we missed a big opportunity to save money. There was um, a special issue of Time Magazine that's on the newsstands right now uh, about health care in the United States and about the health care cost crisis that we're in. And it was interesting, they point out uh, on the pharmaceutical side, uh, for example, one Lipitor pill in the U.S. Um, costs the same uh, or one Lipitor pill in the U.S. would pay for three Lipitor pills in Argentina. One Plavix pill in the U.S. would be the same as four in Spain. One Nexium pill in the U.S. the same as eight in France. What is the rationale behind that? You know, I don't know for sure what happens behind the scenes, but but I know that these prices are all negotiated between insurance companies and pharmacies and whoever sells the drugs. The actual physician and, and patient who is the customer are mm -hmm. left out of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think when, if a patient was involved as a consumer, that the prices would drop if they wanted to sell the drug. Mm -hmm. But right now, the patient is not in, engaged in the cost of the drug because the insurance covers it. So it's whatever the insurance decides to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Again, totally arbitrary. Well, you mentioned coding earlier, and let's explain a little bit more about what we're talking about. What is a CPT code? You talk about this in the book. Tell our viewers about coding, and specifically tell us about how insurance companies use coding to control doctors in terms of how you practice medicine. Yeah, the, the codes are used to identify the services that we provide, and then and then there's other codes that identify disease diseases. So mm -hmm. if I provide a service, I have to justify the service by connecting it to a certain disease. And we do that by codes. So everything I do has an ICD-9 code and a CPT code that justify each other. And, and you all, put this in the computer all while that you're is seeing entered the, in the computer, Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so that is a way of the insurance company giving me permission. That's a way of me asking for permission. And if they accept the codes, then that translates into a dollar reimbursement. Does this sometimes cause you to uh, maybe change the code that you'd use? And these codes are very precise, right? They describe very precise symptoms or conditions? Yes, but what we do is so variable that there's still not enough codes to even describe what we do on a daily basis. So we look at the best code, put it in whatever's going to get us reimbursed. Mm -hmm. And the codes translate also into dollars. And so we want to put it in a way that we actually get reimbursed an appropriate mm -hmm. amount. Mm -hmm. What happens, how, or I should ask you, how much of your average day is spent arguing with insurance companies? And maybe not you personally, Dr. Brown, because you're busy seeing a steady stream of patients throughout the day, but how much of your staff's time is spent on the phone or via email dealing with insurance companies and disputing issues about coding and about charges? It, it's at least an hour, in some days several hours, mm -hmm. uh, for, for just one of my medical assistants. Um, one drug denial you know, could take up to an hour on the phone. Sometimes it's approved in five minutes, sometimes it takes an hour of multiple phone calls. Mm -hmm. And that's just arguing with the insurance company. Everything else I do is still is still aimed at pleasing them. So everything pleasing I, the insurance, insurance company. company, right? So that we can get reimbursed. Yeah. So taking the time to enter the codes to make sure they match, to make sure that we'll get reimbursed, 
is all day long every day. But you have to do that as a small independent practice to remain economically viable to keep your business going. Everybody too. does that, even the large clinics do right. that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right. And again, that's time when you're having to do that, that's time you're not spending, obviously, with patients, actually treating patients. Absolutely. Which is presumably a... why you went to medical school in the first place. Right, so it's time away from patients and it also limits my decision making because if I want the services covered, I have to make sure they're approved by the insurance company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about formularies, drug formularies. What is a drug formulary? A, for a drug formulary is a list of drugs that is covered by that patient's insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And if we take 30 different insurances and there's different plans within each insurance company, we deal with 30 plus formularies and they can change on a regular basis. So the formularies are historically have been uh, to limit the use of expensive drugs. Mm -hmm. um, now in 2013 there's another level that's developed that I think is completely uh, contrary to good medical practice. They're making medical decisions. So now some of the safe, uh, I'm, pardon me, some of the cheap drugs that have been around for a long time have dropped off the formulary because they're too dangerous in a certain age group. So if you're taking a sleeping pill at age 64 and then you turn 65 and it's not recommended for over 65, they suddenly drop it off the formulary for you. Even though it actually might be perfectly uh, yes. safe for e you to take it at age 65. Yes. Mm -hmm. So then that requires phone calls and paperwork to say this patient is benefiting from this, he has no side effects, will you please cover it? So the CPT codes, which uh, by the way, current procedure terminology, the formal name for CPT codes, and the formularies are being used by insurance companies to control how doctors are practicing medicine. And they're controlling patients' options too, it sounds like. Right, that's the way they control it, mm -hmm. is by coding everything. In. Mm -hmm. And in your book, Dr. Brown, you actually uh, had a number of examples, of course, using uh, uh, fictitious patient names because of privacy concerns. And you give examples of this where um, disputes with insurance companies about a particular type of medicine that they won't allow or trying to steer you toward a generic medication which may be less expensive for that particular patient but may not be as medically um, uh, effective for that particular patient. Tell us a little bit more about that. How often do you run into that? Uh, we run into that almost every day to some degree. Sometimes the more expensive antibiotic is the more, e is the more effective one. Mm -hmm. But we have to try the, the less effective one first and see if it fails. Mm -hmm. Um, we run into this a lot with blood pressure medication, a lot of side mm -hmm. effects of blood pressure medications, and maybe the more, expen more expensive one gives less side effects. Mm -hmm. But we have to try the ones on formulary first and document that they failed it. So let me give you a, a different drug, see if it caused dizziness, see if you passed out, see if you broke your hip. Then I'll tell the insurance company. Trial by error. Right? <laughs> yes, try Isn't yes. that what it is? Exactly. And then we document that on the chart and then we send it to the insurance company and say, they tried this, this happened, will you cover the more expensive one? And by the way, we should mention too, any of us who have health insurance policies, and, and I'm, I have a health insurance policy I'm covered too, that we pretty much sign away our rights to privacy, right? Because these insurance companies can be monitoring what you're prescribing how I'm reacting to a particular drug that you may prescribe. They can gather this data uh, individually and collectively to use it for reports and other statistical purposes. Is that something patients should be concerned about too? About how they're using that information? Yes, I mean, when you go into the doctor's office, you sign your name and what you're signing is that you released all information to the insurance company. And the reason why you do that is because they want to make sure we're billing correctly. And they want, they want access to the chart to make sure that we haven't done anything that they don't approve. And so you're basically releasing your information to multi-billion dollar companies that are using a lot of this information for marketing purposes. Mm -hmm. The centerpiece of your book is what some people might view as a rather radical proposal. And I want you to spend a couple of minutes talking to our viewers and to me about that. You basically, to summarize, and I'd like you to elaborate on it, you propose basically abolishing private health insurance for outpatient care, as I understand. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
in its, out, in its current form. In its I, current form. Yes. And that really we would use health insurance in the future, in your thinking, for catastrophic illness or more serious inpatient types of medical care. Tell us about how this would work. Explain how would a, a medical savings account work? And why would it be better than the private insurance system we have now for outpatient care? We have insurance for other parts of our lives like car insurance, house insurance, it covers catastrophic events. I don't call my house insurance when I want to repaint a wall and they tell me what brand and what color. Right. So taking that same concept to health care, health care insurance should be just for the catastrophic high cost unexpected events like hospitalization, maybe chemotherapy, a few other high cost things. Everything else should be done on a cash basis, consumer driven, um, you know, what doctor should I see? Um, what medication should I see? Well, doctor, what drug is best for me? And how much does that one cost? How much? We can have a real conversation. Mm -hmm. And so th the way I see it then is the other part of your health cost would be put into a medical account that works like cash and you can spend it like cash. And would it be transferable? Could you transfer that money uh, upon your death to one of your family members or somebody else? Yes, I would like that to be an account that's owned by the individual. Mm -hmm. And then and then it would be transferable. And it, and it could only be used for health for healthcare. So what would happen in the situation where an individual, um, maybe they're not poor enough to qualify for Medicaid or as we call it in Minnesota, medical assistance for low income folks. They're not that poor. Mm -hmm. but maybe they're working poor, they're working at a low wage job, but they don't really make enough money to put money into an MSA. What would you do with them or somebody also for the person who may have spent the money in their MSA? How would you take care of those folks? Well, well first, who's ever paying your health care puts money in part in, in the catastrophic piece and also puts cash into the MSA, which is medical savings account. So say you, your employer would, would put money in there, or if you're poor, the government would put money in there. But I think putting money in that account allows maybe the government to, um, uh, to put a graduated amount depending on your income. Mm -hmm. So let's say your, you, your income is higher than, higher than you would qualify mm -hmm. for, say, Medicaid. You could still get a certain amount of money put in there. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think a broader idea is that um, if we lower health care costs by introducing you know, this way of paying for health care, now let's say the person making $30,000 who's uninsured mm -hmm. um, gets his catastrophic completely covered, so the major stuff is covered, and now when he needs to see a doctor and take a blood pressure pill, that's only going to cost a couple hundred dollars a year. And, and you argue in your book, too, that if we were to move toward this MSA model for outpatient care and away from health insurance as a way to pay for that, that we could also eliminate some of the instances of insurance fraud that are occurring, which also drive up the cost of health care. Because the insurance companies, when that fraud happens, they're passing it on in the form of higher premiums. Yeah, w when a third party pays, there's a lot of fraud. But when you, when t when you get, get your hair cut, and you pay right on the spot, what kind of fraud is there for paying for it's your haircut? It's a direct haircut? transaction. Right, so that, that's what will happen. Then the patient pays the doctor or the pharmacist right, at, right on the spot. Mm -hmm. So fraud almost goes away for outpatient care. So as one thinks about this proposal, and, and uh, you know, I don't think you've advertised this idea in your book anyway as a be-all, end-all solution, but as a way to start moving toward containing increasing health care costs which are growing way beyond the annual rate of inflation in this country and they have been for some time reducing the instances of fraud giving patients more choice freeing doctors from having to deal with insurance companies to the extent they do I think you mentioned that 65 percent of health uh, of patients interactions with insurance or insurance reimbursements are for outpatient care the remainder would be for for inpatient. hospitalization yes. hospitalization yes, yes. Um, you've actually taken this idea further in your own practice uh, your patients me included received a letter from your practice in December 2012 indicating that effective April 15th this year about a month and a half from right now 
your, your practice will no longer accept uh, in, uh, private health insurance and that patients will have to pay directly and then they can seek reimbursement with the exception of Medicare patients, I believe. Did you, you yes, exempted correct. Medicare patients? And so tell us a little bit about how you expect that to work. Do you, are you concerned that some of your patients in your practice may say, you know, Dr. Brown, I don't like dealing with insurance companies any more than you do, and I'm going to have to go find another doctor? Yes. Yeah, we will lose some patients, uh, especially patients who have good insurance coverage because they, they're not going to want to pay twice. Mm -hmm. But we're a great value for patients who have deductibles, health savings accounts. And if you look at our fee schedule, you'll find out it's lower than insurance reimbursed fees, re mm. re reimbursed rates for clinics that are contracted. Mm -hmm. So we're a great value for those patients. Those patients will want to stay in our clinic. And your overhead costs should actually go down because if you're not processing all these insurance claims, I think you had mentioned to me on a recent uh, visit you and I had that you're expecting through attrition that you just sim simply won't fill some staff positions in your practice. Right, because we'll you won't need staff. you won't need yes. as many staff if you're not having to process as many uh, insurance issues and dealing with insurance companies. And then I will also be free to provide care that is not allowed under insurance now. Uh, Good point. The, the example is the new diabetic on insulin. Text me as sugars every day. I text back an insulin dose. Why don't I incorporate that into my practice now? Because they don't pay me for it. I don't mm. have time to do it. <laughs> now I'm going to have time to do it. They can. Right. If the patient wants that interaction with me, they can do that. So if this works out the way that you hope it will, Dr. Brown, and I hope it does because I don't have any intention of going anywhere, you're still <laughs> you. hopefully going to be my physician. And if, you're, if your practice achieves the kind of savings that you believe you will by basically setting the insurance companies aside, um, are you going to pass those savings on to your patients? Absolutely. And I think you can see we're expecting that already by looking at our fee schedule. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it is online, Southdale Internal Medicine, PA.com. The fee schedule is listed, and you'll find out that those fees are significantly less than insurance mm -hmm. reimbursements. Last question for you, Dr. Brown. Um, and I, I just have to say I really applaud you for having the courage to take on the insurance companies and pointing out some of the problems that many of us have realized about the insurance industry for a long time, about how it gets between doctors and patients, that relationship, and how it interferes in a most unproductive way. Do you have any expectation that public policy will move in this direction? Yes, I hope it will. And somebody needs to stand up and, and not go along with the crowd. And so far, you know, many clinics are just following the crowd, going to the big box clinics, just following along. And somebody needs to step out and make a change. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that we have had a lot of positive feedback. There's a lot of demand for the brand of medicine that we practice, the individualized care. It's a more personalized type of and care. And I think that'll catch on. Yeah, very good. Well, uh, Dr. Brown, I don't know how strongly the insurance companies will welcome your proposal, but it's certainly very provocative and you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you very much for being our guest on Access to Democracy, Dr. Merlin Brown. Thanks.